Okay, our last presenter before lunch um, is Jerry Snore. Um, update on climate change and water. I'm interested in hearing this update. Uh, Jerry holds the Allen Henry Chair in Engineering and is a professor at the University of Iowa. He co-founded and co-directs the University Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research. Many of you may know that he um, served as the Editor-in-Chief of Environmental Science and Technology, very important journal, and has really um, uh, done a lot to, in, I think, uh, enhance the, the global scope of articles looking uh, at uh, engineering and chemistry and water. He's also well known for phytoremediation, and he um, received the Clark Water Prize in 2010. Um, he's always looked at uh, these interfaces between air and water and land, and now he's been really looking at this global issue of climate change. I know last year I was really struck by the presentation on this, on the 95% confidence limits that you presented um, globally around precip and temperature, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say this year. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, John, very much. And thanks to NWRI for uh, inviting me to speak. This uh, organization has become a real force, I think, in the water world. And that's to the credit of all the people who are here, I would say, today. Uh, I was asked to give an update on uh, climate change. And actually, I'm about to go to the uh, Paris talks on climate change, taking a few uh, students and so uh, it was a good opportunity for me to study the latest also and I'll try to tell you what I learned. Of course we could do a talk on any number of factors which are all contributing to water unsustainability and many of them have been men mentioned already uh, this morning in some fine uh, presentations but let's concentrate on just the first one today and that's climate change and why does that threaten our, our future water supplies. There was kind of a neat paper in ESNT a few years ago uh, by Roy et al. at, T at Tetra Tech uh, Group here in California. And it showed uh, the continental United States in the lower right hand one here. Oh, it doesn't show up. Uh, where if we had no climate change, of course, we still have some water shortages. We still have some counties where they uh, withdraw and use more water than actually would fall on their footprints or even with the um, imported water from the Owens Canal and so forth. And those are shown in the lower right hand one. So in 2050, we'd expect to have the dark red and the dark brown uh, counties that would have pretty severe uh, water stress as a result of withdrawals greater than uh, water which falls on the footprint. But uh, with the uh, climate change, the picture becomes the upper right uh, continental the United States and you can see the great increase in the area and number of counties that will experience high water stress in 2050 due to climate change. So that's sort of the Mm, that's sort of what we're talking about, really, that the increased stress in our water supplies as a result of uh, climate change getting warmer. And dry areas are getting drier, and wet areas are getting wa wetter in general worldwide. And there's some pretty good climatological reasons for that. And what's more, even in California, what precipitation falls is expected to fall in more intense events. So that's sort of the backdrop in the picture for how it affects our water supplies. Now coming to the climate change, uh, I've actually been going to these talks like the Paris Climate Talks this December for more than 20 years since the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, the origin of this uh, graph. And all countries, 194 now countries are arguing about how to turn this curve upside down. And that's the challenge of a generation. We have to not only uh, level this off, but within mm, the next, say, 20 or 30 years, have an 80% decline in this curve. The day that we just first reach peak emissions, we should have a global party, I think, because it's been a really tough nut to crack. Even if you take the pledges that are now coming in from all the countries uh, to the United Nations, it doesn't even level off this curve of emissions. We have to turn the 
level off the emissions and we have to turn it down by about 80 percent to prevent dangerous interference in climate defined as approximately a two degrees celsius uh, increase in average global temperatures because of this uh, increasing emissions we currently have carbon dioxide at about 400 parts per million and as you know it goes up about two parts per million each and every year like clockwork even accelerating and that results in uh, the temperature record goes back to about 1880, uh, shown here. And the warmest year on record was 2014. We expect 2015 to be the next uh, warmest year on record. And you can see that uh, this increase in carbon dioxide and other uh, greenhouse gases uh, results in a warming effect. Now, I think one thing that's kind of lost, at least uh, uh, the public here in the United States, is that it's not just models that are predicting out to 2100 that it's going to be warmer. It's multiple lines of evidence, really vast amounts of evidence, surface-based measurements, ocean-based seagoing vessels, satellite measurements. We know that the groundwaters that we've talked about this morning are getting warmer, down borehole measurements. The fossil records, ice cores, tree rings, all of these things point towards a warmer uh, future and that it's already warmer and that it's due to human activities. Because any molecule with more than two atoms per molecule can vibrate and rotate when you shine infrared back radiation on it. That means that it's absorbing that radiation like a blanket around the Earth and making it warmer. That's a fact. That's not a theory that these gases uh, trap back radiation. You can see it very clearly uh, in the instrument record. If you look at clouds, above clouds, they're missing the very wavelengths here in carbon dioxide, the absorption spectra, which is shown here. When you look above the clouds, they're, you're on the outgoing long wave radiation, you can see that you're missing those wavelengths. When you look at below the clouds, you can see that that's missing those wavelengths also. When you look at the Earth's surface out, outgoing radiation, the wavelengths are there. Very clear evidence that uh, the absorption of greenhouse gases is indeed warming the Earth. But for me, the smoking gun uh, has occurred since 2005, and that's these Argo floats. You'd like to make a simple measurement. You'd like to measure all the energy coming into the Earth and all the energy going out. And since year 2005, we've done that in a sense by having, mm, now it's almost 4,000 Argo floats. You can look at them on your computer where they are at this very minute. It's the lower right-hand corner picture. 4,000 floats from many, many countries, which are programmed, uh, solar-powered, and programmed to dive down over an eight or 10-day cycle to 2,000 meters, recording very precisely the temperature and salinity of the oceans. So we know the heat content of the oceans as we've never known it before. I would say unequivocal evidence. If you look at the uh, data from NOAA, this is the 2014 analysis of how much heat is in the ocean, you can see that each year we're, we're gaining about 0.5 times 10 to the 22 joules of energy. That may not sound like much, uh, but to put it, try to put it into perspective, it's 10 to 20 times the total primary energy consumption, the enthalpy, the heat from all the oil, gas, and uh, coal that we burn each year on Earth, we're putting 10 or 20 times that amount of heat into the oceans. It actually is a, it's a vast thermal mass that we're leaving for future generations. When you start to do that, the oceans begin to warm up. So the sea surface is this, if you smear the red color here over the whole 
planet it's about 0 0.6 degrees Celsius warmer just in my lifetime just in the last uh, 50 years or so so if you would have told me when I graduated from college could we change the entire oceans I would have said mm, maybe the atmosphere certainly some local places we can pollute those but we'd never be able to change the whole ocean but indeed we are it's about 0 0.6 degrees Celsius warmer and what's more as you know because one of the greenhouse gases CO2 is a weak acid it's uh, mass transfer exchanging with the surface of the ocean and it's causing the pH to go down again in my lifetime from about pH 8.2 to currently about pH 8.08 that's a log scale as you know that's about a 30 percent increase in acidity in our lifetime not only are we changing the thermal mass the temperature of the oceans we're changing the entire chemistry of the ocean by the end of t this century by 2100 if this trend continues we'll have a pH of 7.8 or 7.9 in the oceans I don't know if corals can form I don't know if uh, salacious animals can form a shell of aragonite or calcite under those kind of conditions maybe they can adapt but it will certainly be much much harder the recent story has to do with sea level rise and the ice that's melting in the arctic does not raise sea level because it's already uh, floating there but we have very accurate measurements actually the it's uh, related to the groundwater uh, central valley instrument that we were talking about it's a gravimetric analysis that's how we have pretty good uh, data on how much is melting and this is also from satellites about a three to four percent per decade melt rate with summer minimums about eleven percent per decade uh, less if you're an animal that depends on uh, fishing or living on the edge of this uh, ice of course it's melting so you're probably in trouble Greenland is a is a big mm, ice sheet which is melting also uh, rapidly about the volume of Lake Erie half of the volume of Lake Erie every year is melting and going into the ocean and that's the more recent story 10 or 20 years ago it was just the thermal expansion of the oceans because they're getting uh, warmer as, as we see uh, that was the cause of the sea level rise but now about half of it is due to the loss of water from land-based ice like in Greenland and Antarctica of course we worry is there a tipping point and very difficult to make those kind of projections we have no models that can do it whatsoever and so mostly the United Nations scientists kind of throw up their hands and don't make any estimate of the probability of a tipping point here where the ice which falls down the shaft that you see lubricates the land ice interface such that it could slip off more rapidly and raise sea level quite we, we don't even really consider that it is a concern especially in uh, western Antarctic here the gravimetric Newton's universal law of gravitation is amazing the pull of the ice on the satellite changes the orbit such that we can instrumentally measure with some accuracy the total loss rate of ice each year and it's about 30 to 147 uh, billion tons gigatons per year uh, over the last 20 year period from uh, 1992 to 2011 we have experienced progressively increasing ice shelf collapse especially in the western tip there of Antarctica and I don't have a pointer but in Amundsen Bay which is just down about in the middle of the uh, Antarctic on the western uh, side this is the Thwaites in the lower right picture is Thwaites glacier that's one that we're watching very closely it alone could raise sea level about a half of a meter all of these icebergs that are mentioned here ice shelves if they were to collapse in a tipping point we don't think they will and the probability is low but if they were we're talking about about a five meter rise in sea level 
So the official United Nations projections from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is just between a half to one meter change in sea level uh, by the end of the century. And th that may not sound like much, but it's really the storm surge that matters. And even a small increment in one decade, about three centimeters that we're experiencing now per decade, is enough to make a difference in damages due to the storm surge that goes along with it. Extremes are changing. Hurricane Sandy in 2012, followed by one year Hurricane Irene, devastating hurricanes that hit the east coast of America. These are massive in scale, almost a thousand meters uh, in size the, of the total storm event, and the lowest pressure ever recorded on the eastern seaboard of 940 uh, millibars. And that was followed the next year by Hurricane Haiyan in the Philippines, uh, the largest storm ever measured in that part of the world. Again, continental size and scale. Uh, the, it uh, killed over 6,000 people in one minute sustained winds of about 195 miles per hour. Again, the lowest pressure ever recorded, 895 millibars. We're setting all kinds of records almost on a yearly basis for storms. We don't think that the, the IPCC report also does not believe that the number of hurricanes and typhoons will increase, but rather the frequency and number of the f category four and five, the really big ones will increase. Uh, actually the um, wind shear in the vertical direction which creates the storms will be lessened, especially in the Caribbean and the Pacific. But the warm water fuels these bigger storms. For example, uh, Hurricane Patricia, which just hit last week. The water w uh, off the coast of uh, Peru is 31 degrees Celsius, 88 degrees Fahrenheit. It's like bath water. So that's why also lowest pressure ever recorded in the uh, eastern uh, North Pacific and, and or the Atlantic Ocean, 879 millibars. How low can we go? It just keeps going down and down the records. 200 mile per hour sustained winds. Uh, fortunately, it grew very rapidly, was not predicted well, but hit in a Mm, rather favorable location if, if you could have such with not many uh, people. No fatalities. Amazing. Extremes are increasing. If you look at the United States, this is the 1% uh, tile event. So we've got records going back more than 100 years. And the 1% st tile storm would be that which only occurs 1% of the time in a year. And in the Midwest, those are occurring about 45% more frequently just in the last 50 years. And in the Northeast, about 74% more frequently. Even in California, the one percentile event, uh, we're projected to get drier here, but the one percentile event is greater because when the rains come, it comes in more severity. Certainly we felt it in Iowa. We're still rebuilding from our biggest one in 2008. 20 buildings were flooded on, on campus. Uh, we've had essentially 100 year recurrence interval storms in 2008. 2010, 2013, and 2014, punctuated by a drought in 2012. So the record drought in the United States continues here in the western part. Uh, it looks, it, it would, papers would indicate that the drought is uh, maybe 20% more severe than it would have would have been without climate change. And that's because when you have very little soil moisture in an arid place, it's driven off much sooner. So the drought becomes more severe and longer, about 20%. 
We're running models at the University of Iowa and using results from the NARCAP experiments. That's the North American Regional Climate Change Assessment Program, where you use global models to set the boundary conditions for regional models. There's quite a few of these which we're tracking. We uh, are looking at 11 different combinations of regional models embedded inside of global models. And so for the Pacific Southwest shown here, uh, you can look at the results of what it's projected to be like 50 years from now compared to the period 1971 to 1998 for a kind of moderate IPCC uh, development scenario. You can see in the upper left hand quadrant here that the winter, the 11 models agree quite well. Precipitation is on the y axis and temperature is on the x axis. So the bullet is tight and it indicates that it's going to be warmer, about 2 degrees Celsius warmer 50 years from now here in uh, California. And mm, not so much uh, wetter. And if you go over to the spring, it looks like it's going to be warmer and drier. And if you go to the summer, the models don't agree. And summer is very, very important. It's going to be warmer, but they, it's not clear whether it's going to be wetter or uh, drier. My prediction is that we're going to understand, we're going to come to understand climate change through water resources as the greatest manifestation uh, of a problem. And you can see that for the planetary body, the mean precipitation change is especially acute in the brown areas, let's say Australia, South Africa, the Mediterranean, and yes, the southwest is drier, but not the most severe place in terms of drier. There's already signs that water is less sustainable due to climate change. Rivers are no longer flowing to the sea. Wells are running dry. Unprecedented droughts and floods. We've always had droughts and floods. What's different is that the frequency of the number of those is increasing. As we said, glaciers are melting and algae blooms are worse. This is an example of a river that no longer flows to the sea and it used to. That's the Yellow River in China. But it could also be the Colorado River in the US. It could be the Indus River in Pakistan, the Amandari, and so on and so on. Lake Erie and Toledo, Ohio are the current poster child in the United States for cyanobacteria and microcystin toxin, which we thought we sort of had licked, are getting uh, worse which of course affects water quality. The most severe location for glacier melt would be the tropical glaciers like in the Andes and here in Peru. Small tropical glaciers are melting very fast below 17 meters and it contributes 66 percent of the drinking water of the water supply for 1.8 million people and it'll be gone in within two decades or so. We already heard about Lake Mead and the Colorado River. This is not only due to climate change, although climate change contributes, but also the excessive withdrawals for agriculture and for people, the lowest level since 1937. Wells are running dry. In Kansas, there's Wichita County, Kansas, there is no water. The only way to get water is to import it uh, from bottled systems. And all those areas, all the aquifers shown in brown color here are those which will last only until about 2025. So there is no more water. We're going to see more and more projects like the China South to North project. The currently, it's currently the biggest civil engineering project on the planet. About $62 billion project, 3,000 kilometers of canals, similar maybe to what California did uh, 100 years ago. The price for the finished water is uh, much more and they're having some social uh, acceptance problems with uh, bringing in the water. 
I don't know if this is a best practice, but I'm just about to move into the final coup de grace of the, of the talk, uh, Joan. This is the best practice, I don't know. It's a, it's a huge power plant, a 4,000 megawatt coal-fired power plant uh, in uh, Tianjin. There's four plants planned right next to uh, many of uh, their desalination plant, and they use the west waste heat to drive the process with great savings, actually, in the, in the desal plant. Water's about twice as expensive, eight yuan per cubic meter. We've already heard about the best practices here, and I don't need to uh, go into it more, but certainly California and Orange County is a leader. And we heard earlier today about the Carlsbad desalination plant, 50 MGD, about to come online here in, uh, well, nearby in San Diego County. We're practicing direct potable reuse. That's a sign of uh, climate change in places like Big Spring, Texas, where they had no more water during drought and they had to begin to treat it very highly and use it directly, not with an environmental barrier like the reservoir we heard about in San Diego. We're gonna see more direct potable reuse, a great deal more indirect potable reuse, and of course, inadvertent reuse has always gone on. We're just asking the question now, how much wastewater is in your water, and is it safe? That's, that's the question. I, I would submit that a lot of these problems that we're talking about could be fixed with water pricing, intelligent pricing. We still have places like uh, Phoenix and Las Vegas and Salt Lake City with some of the lowest water prices in the country. Go figure. So we're, we're now looking at it as one water. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about groundwater or surface water. It's all part of the same system and that's how we have to think and teach our children how to think. We heard from Joe Hughes this morning about the new sustainable development goals. We have new goals going out to 2030. It's an opportune time for us and for our students to address both water and sanitation for all and for stopping climate change. So the Paris Peace Talks are part of the issue and uh, I have hopes for the Paris Peace Talks, though most of the action is still at the state level and industries and NGOs. Oh. And uh, with that, uh, <laughs> I think I got cut off. But uh, thank you very much, and uh, if there's time, I'll answer some questions. Thank you, Jerry. Oh, it's, uh, our very you, you really did get <laughs> cut off. That's an effective way I did, to stop. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> um, how about some uh, questions for Jerry? Quick questions before we Joan, I, I, is, this is working, I think? Yes, Joan. Uh, uh, Jerry, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Joan. Um, and, and working with the hydrologic cycle is extremely important. But I wanted to hear your comments on what I think is another parallel issue with climate change and that's human displacement. Yeah, Largely that, due to sea level rise, but not exclusively. Um, can you shed some light on the predictions on human displacement? There is a whole, as you may know, the last report from the IPCC is on kind of the human dimensions, and there is a whole chapter on, on this subject. In, but the sea level rise is the largest part of it, actually. And um, it, we're, we're going to have a lot of environmental refugees. We do already, both in the island nations like the Maldives and, of course, uh, Bangladesh. And, and New York City is in jeopardy. And remember that land you were going to buy in Miami, Joe? I don't know. I don't know about that. Um, you know, I, I was reading that flooding is still the number one cause of, of economic damage you know, to infrastructure as well as, um, you know, other losses, disease, and yeah. even human loss from drowning and things like that. But it doesn't seem to me that we have a good sense of the idea of flooding uh, associated with the climate change. And you mentioned the storm surges and other things, but 
are they going to start to try to deal with the definition of flooding and 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 flooding is a huge uh, human health hazard as well as the damage function is i think appreciated and and talked about but joan you and i have talked about all the people waiting in uh, floodwaters contaminated with sewage and the aromonas and all the different organisms that they can be exposed to is really bad but for us in iowa with all the floods we've had it's the uh, fungus in the homes after they begin to uh, clean out that 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 is probably the biggest health uh, people who have are sensitive the respiratory, respiratory illnesses it, we underestimated re really bad yeah other other comments well let's thank uh, Jerry one more time <laughs>